Speaking of liberty, the National Broadcasting Company presents another in a special series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. There was free talk in the old New England town hall and around the cracker barrel in the crossroads store, and there's free talk by free men every week at this time, led by our host, Rex Stout. You may already know Rex Stout as the author of intriguing detective stories featuring that master criminologist, Nero Wolfe. Well, on this program, you'll get to know him even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy. Mr. Stout. Thank you, George Putnam. Good evening, friends of liberty. Some people who are honest and candid, and many who are somewhat less candid, confuse the imperfections of a good thing with the inherent and irremovable vices of an evil thing. They point either with sorrow or with ill-disguised glee to a race riot in an American city and demand, who are we to condemn a purge in Russia or a pogrom in Germany? Those who ask that question in good faith, in honest bewilderment, are entitled to an answer. And no one in America is better qualified to give it than our guest this evening. Previously, as guests on this series of programs, we have had a biographer, a novelist, a foreign correspondent, an editor, an historian, and others. Max Eastman's various and distinguished achievements cannot be embraced in any single term, but he is here this evening in his role as a social and political theorist and analyst, a field in which his reputation has been made by such books as Artists in Uniform and Marxism is It Science, his answer to that question being no. All his life, Mr. Eastman has worked for social change and has been a severe critic of our government and politics. He still is a radical. He opposed the entry of our country into the World War, vigorously into the last ditch. Yet today his position is different. I take it, Mr. Eastman, you now believe that democracy is in grave danger and must be defended at any risk and any cost. Or is that overstating it? Not a bit, Mr. Stout, but I insist that the change is not in me. Then where is it? In the other camp. You mean in Hitler as compared to the Kaiser? Not actually in their persons, no. In their purposes and intentions, yes. Well, wasn't it the purpose and intention of the Kaiser's Germany to destroy British power? And isn't the same thing true of Hitler's Germany? Yes, but that isn't the whole story. The other war was a struggle for national power, and there was no reason to suppose it would cut any deeper than that. This war, too, is a struggle for national power, but it is also a struggle between democracy and tyranny. One side has openly armed itself with tyranny as a social and political system. It fights to impose that system. It fights with the fifth column in the territories of its enemy. It has not only declared its purpose to impose a tyrannical system throughout the world, but it has demonstrated in the countries already under its heel the ruthless logic with which it intends to carry that purpose through. Some left-wing highbrows say that is only window dressing. They say that the basic factor, as in the last war, is the economic conflict of rival imperialisms. I know they do. Those guys have an unfortunate habit which is due to the recent vogue of the Marxian religion. They regard any statement of obvious fact, if not translatable into the terms of economic science, as superficial. I should think that a scientist, more than anyone else, could not afford to ignore an obvious fact. He can't, and it's an obvious fact that this war is, if any ever, war ever was, a war between two ways of life. You will not find a deeper contrast in all the records of men's battle cries than that between Mein Kampf and the speeches of Churchill and Roosevelt. This contrast indicates the significance to mankind of the result of the war, however little it may reflect its causes. The conflict between Babylon and Judea, Egypt and Assyria, Athens and Sparta, Greece and Persia even, showed no cultural contrast to compare with that between modern democracy and totalitarianism. You're covering a lot of territory, Mr. Eastman. That's an extreme statement. Of course, it's the crux of the whole matter. What if you were challenged to prove it? Do you mean right here and now? start anyway. I would need hours, not minutes. What you ask is a complete comparison between totalitarianism and democracy. Well, suppose I go over some of the basic features of totalitarianism found today in Germany, Italy, and Russia, and not found in England or the United States, nor, let me emphasize this, in the Germany of 1914. These differences are matters of record known to all who have watched the theories of totalitarianism carried into action. First, then, nationalistic emotion is exalted to the point of religious frenzy. Second, 
A single party, disciplined like an army, subject to command and enforcing a monopoly of the political field, takes over the power of the state. The state is reduced to the position of a false front whose function is to ratify the decisions of the party. And put them into execution. Yes. Third, the church, like the state, is permitted to exist, but its priests and even its God must recognize the superior authority of the party. The new religion finds its focus of devotion in the leader who becomes to all intents and purposes himself a god. Fourth, dissenting opinion is coerced by means of universal spying and informing, concentration camps, star chamber trials, torture, wholesale execution, and secret murder. It's against those things that some people balance an American race riot, for example. That's right, and it's ridiculous. The sporadic outbursts of illegal violence in our democracy are, as you said, examples of the imperfections of a good thing. They are condemned by the vast majority of the people. Nazi and communist and fascist violence are the settled policy of the parties who control the state. Shall I go on? As much as we have time for. Now for the fifth. Fifth, anti-intellectualism. Denial of freedom of the mind, of all independent thinking and honest inquiry. Strictly speaking, this is barbarism. It takes various forms. Exaltation of the ignorant and lazy-minded, persecution, jail, death, or exile to those who stand for strenuous and honest thought, physical destruction of books and records, falsification of history, abolition of all debate and discussion, total cultural isolation of the people who are taught to believe preposterous fables about their own virtues and superiorities, and the desperate condition of the outside world. Perhaps worst of all, the prostitution of science and art to the service of the leader and the party, and denial of their service to truth and realization, which is what mankind created them for. There is... Wait a uh, minute. Is all that a part of the fifth point, anti-intellectualism, or did you stop numbering? Those are all forms of anti-intellectualism or barbarism. I could go on... Better give us the sixth. Well, the sixth is immoralism, the disappearance of any code of ethics whatever in public life. In England or America, political lying and governmental hypocrisy are deplorable incidents in a country not inhabited exclusively by angels. In Germany and Russia and Italy, they have been adopted as a system. Libel and slander, fake plebiscites, solemn caricatures of judicial procedure, counterfeits and parodies of representative government are accepted as a normal course. Fooling all the people all the time is the essential function of the state apparatus. Seventh, they have revived the barbaric principle of family and tribal guilt for the crime of the individual. Yes, that seems to me especially revealing. When Rudolf Hess flew to Scotland, the significant thing was that people said he must have gone with Hitler's consent because he left his wife and child in Germany. They took it for granted that if he was escaping from personal peril the Nazis would punish him by taking revenge on his family. But suppose it was the other way around. Suppose Sir Oswald Mosley had gone to Germany, or suppose Charles Lindbergh did. Nobody would think of the English or Americans harming their families. Precisely. That's just one of the, these contests I engaged to prove. Another one, the eighth on my list, is their attitude toward war. In a totalitarian state, war is exalted as the supreme activity of mankind. The national revival is focused around and sustained by preparations for everlasting war. The war industries dominate, not through necessity as in a democracy in a period of crisis, but by calculated policy. The population is completely militarized from childhood. And not with toy soldiers. There's nothing toy about it, even with the youngsters. It isn't a game, it's a serious and grim business. And ninth... Woman is subordinated and laws are passed against her independence. The totalitarian regimes are male regimes. Women's business in them is to breed children. Tenth, the rights of labor are abolished. Labor unions are company unions, and the company is the state, or rather the party which controls the state. Eleventh, industry, commerce, and agriculture are rigidly controlled, again not by the government, but by the party and its leader. Twelve... Let's stop short of a dozen. If you haven't already proved your point, Mr. Eastman, you never will. The blind do not see and the deaf do not hear. Well, I could go on. But so far as I've gone, that's totalitarianism. Opinions may vary as to certain of those items. 
But in their son they show an issue at stake in this war as momentous as mankind has ever faced. Those radicals and progressives who say it is of no concern to America are blindfolding their own eyes. Many of them rationalize their anti-war dogma by asserting that democracies will become fascist through the mere process of defending themselves. As I see it, that is muddled thinking, if thinking at all. They should take a look at history. You would think that Cincinnatus never went back to the plow, that George Washington never retired to Mount Vernon. You would think that John Wilkes Booth was right when he killed Lincoln as a tyrant. Haven't we just seen a world war followed by a tremendous spread of democratic systems almost everywhere? These discoverers of the so-called historic law according to which democracy turns into fascism in the very act of resisting it have not found knowledge but lost faith. They have lost faith in democracy. They are no longer themselves in it and of it, making it survive, making it grow all the time. It's even possible that some of them, having lost faith in democracy, are groping around for a new one and are beguiled by the glitter of fascism Consciously or unconsciously? Yes, and why? Because fascism is primitive. Because it appeals. Beneath the whole fabric of learned attitudes and modes of behavior which constitute civilization to those blind instincts of the tribal savage which survive in varying degrees in all of us. But fascism is not spread by purpose resistance to the tribes already stricken with, at least of all by their defeat in war. It is spread by fear and propaganda among civilized nations that are confused and searching for a purpose. Well, they will never find any purpose if they let pass this obvious one of defending civilization itself. I must remind you that you are a radical, Mr. Eastman. And I add that all strategists agree that a thing can be defended, civilization itself can be successfully defended, only by a vigorous and violent counterattack upon those who are attempting to destroy it. I'm quite aware of that, Mr. Stout, and I don't dodge the implication. Radical or conservative, we cannot forego this opportunity not only to shatter tyranny, but to destroy its vogue perhaps forever. To avoid that issue out of loyalty to a dogmatic anti-war radicalism seems to me sheer folly. The true place for radicals and liberals is in the ranks of those who are making a firm stand against barbarism and making it with a resolve that out of the victory shall come a world union of democratic states capable of ensuring peace and civilized existence throughout the earth. In that direction lies the hope that a planned social movement may yet solve the problems that confuse and bedevil us. In the other direction lies death to everything that men of goodwill have ever fought for. A death that need not come. For certainly it is true of civilization and of American freedom and democracy as a part of it, and not the least part, that it can die only by suicide. Thank you, Mr. Eastman. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this evening is Max Eastman. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You have just heard the ninth of a special series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring Alexander Wilcott to the microphone. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed free to anyone requesting it. The Council will also be glad to send information on its activities to any listener on request. Please address your letter or card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has been presented as a public service by NBC and the independent radio stations associated with the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.